Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you all today. So as we are turning to our scripture lesson for this day, would you please join me in prayer? Holy God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Still any voice within us but your own. Give us ears and eyes and hearts that are ready to receive all you will say to us and are even more than ready to follow you into the light of this world that we might serve you well. And now may the words of our mouths and the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So my friends, today we are jumping gospels, which I'm going to talk a little more about in a few minutes. So listen now to our gospel lesson as it comes to us from John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with that person. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can anyone enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world may be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and the people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So what do you remember about your baptism? Most Presbyterians cannot actually remember their own baptisms because they were sprinkled as infants, often in family hand-me-down gowns, surrounded by family and friends in a church of some significance. There is no tongue in my cheek right now because that's precisely how my twin sons were baptized nearly six years ago, and it was a glorious celebration. But believe it or not, 
I actually remember my baptism. You see, when my parents got married in the summer of 1969, they had to be wed in my great aunt Jane's house. Yes, she's my namesake. And they were married in a house because neither family would set foot in the other one's church. My mother's family was Presbyterian, but my father's family was strict Roman Catholic which meant that the renegade priest and the pope of the Presbyterian church who married them, and no one ever clarified exactly what that meant, by the way, had to flip coins for who would do what in the ceremony. Thirteen years later, when I finally arrived on the scene, the overjoyed grandparents were so excited that the battle royale began anew this time over what the first child of this union would be. My Catholic grandmother asked my father so many times, again and again and again, what I would be, that eventually her son simply said, Hindu. And she never bothered him again. They actually didn't baptize me as a baby. Apparently, my father's Presbyterian blood had won out because that's what his father's family line had been all the way back past the revolution, so I would find out in college. My parents wanted me to choose when I was ready. But around middle school, as confirmation time was drawing near, I thought perhaps it was time that I should take the plunge. My father had never been practicing before he died, so I was raised in Presbyterian Sunday school. And though I had taken a few years off after his death because the teachers kept saying all the wrong things that you should never say to anyone after someone dies, true story, I had been drawn back into my mom's church by youth group, that shelter in the wilderness of that pure and utter torture on earth known as middle school. At the same time, my dad, my stepdad that is, had entered into our lives by then, and he too was Roman Catholic. But unlike daddy's family, his was the, we're going to get the whole gang together and throw a cool party version. And my dad's church had a rock band and liturgical dancers. It was quite a different uh, type of church. Yet the Presbys still had me at go because they offered something that the Catholics of the time did not. They gave me my own voice. So our story this morning has us, as I said earlier, jumping gospels into that fourth and most random of narratives, John. Unlike the synoptics, John offers its own worldview and approach to Jesus' life and ministry. And since there are only three years in the lectionary, it randomly gets dispersed among all of them so we can actually hear it every now and again. Sometime after Jesus' ministry begins in John, following the wedding at Cana and after he cleanses the temple, which, by the way, it's really impressive he doesn't get arrested right then and there in that gospel, just saying. This Pharisee named Nicodemus comes to visit him in the shadows of the night, when no one else can see. And this clandestine meeting belies the type of faith that this high and mighty leader in the family of Israel truly has. It's not one that he's ready to share publicly. Yet he knows precisely who Jesus is and how important he is to the grand scheme of God's work in the world. So Jesus, in return, offers him a riddle of sorts. You must be born anothen. The Greek word is actually the crux of the matter, really. It can be translated one of three ways. Again, anew or from above. I actually overrode the translation that we used this morning and put again in because everyone would be more familiar with it. Not to mention that that is immediately where Nicodemus's mind goes, doesn't it? 
How can I crawl up back in my mom's belly and be born a second time, Jesus? Now, to be fair, given that this is so early in Jesus' ministry at this point in the Gospel of John, maybe Nicodemus has not yet had a chance to learn how much Jesus likes to speak in metaphor and parable. But on some level, you have to wonder if Jesus didn't give him a look like, seriously, dude? I mean, that's really where you're going with this. Can't, can't you tell I meant something else? So Jesus keeps going. You must be born of water and the Spirit. Couple of things here. First, isn't it interesting that our rebirth in the faith must involve water too, considering the amount of water that is involved whenever we actually enter this world? That probably doesn't really help the Nicodemus, though, sadly. Second, the Spirit, you know, John's author is actually obsessed with the Spirit, the paraclete, the helper, the comforter, the one who comes to carry on. John loves to talk about him in the gospel. And interestingly, to explain the spirit, Jesus discusses the wind, which in Hebrew is actually a synonym for, you guessed it, the spirit. Not surprisingly, though, Nicodemus is even more confused. Jesus then goes on to have this rather extended conversation then about belief and faith along with light. Now, this is one of those moments when we modern readers really need to know something about the Gospel of John and the author's viewpoint to get what is going on here. What is often misunderstood about John is this word belief or belief. You see, faith is never a noun in John. It is an action verb. And belief or believing is never a cognitive exercise that can be separated from our actions or the remainder of our lives. As descendants of the Great Enlightenment, we often forget that our brains and our minds are simply one member of the remarkable bodily creation that God made. For John, to believe is to do, not just to think or to feel. So years after my baptism in seventh grade, I arrived at Wake Forest University in North Carolina to find myself answering a question that I had never heard before. Have you been born again? Huh? Uh, what does that even mean? One of these young college students explained to me that it meant had I accepted Jesus into my heart, and I had to call some of my mentors back home because that was just so wholly different than anything I had ever learned in all of my years growing up in youth group. And yes, I was that youth group kid back in the day who was there whenever the church doors were open. So I had learned a lot. My mentors, they gave me an answer to say whenever someone asked me to get them to back off. And I'll share that in a few minutes. But it was not until the following semester when I met a young man who had spent many years in the Southern Baptist Church that I learned a lot more about what often went along with that question. In his experience, and for many people who have experiences like his, I've learned since, that question was used to designate whether you were in the Jesus Club or if you were out there among the heathens. Even worse, once you were in, there was this set standard of beliefs that you must adhere to. And questions, well, they were never going to be tolerated. Largely because of passages that included ones like this one right here that we're studying this morning. Interestingly, years later, when this man would grow up and convert to our branch of Presbyterianism, he would tell me that his favorite thing about our church is that we have this wondrously wide range of beliefs that are all within the canon, and that all of our questions are always encouraged. 
As I like to say, we all agree that Jesus is Lord and everything else is up for conversation. And despite his Baptist roots, my late husband did end up letting me baptize our infant sons because somewhere inside him, he came to believe, as I do, that at the heart of our faith is this belief that God's love is always acting first in our lives. So what is Jesus really getting at with Nicodemus here? Well, he is speaking to him in a riddle, a parable, and a prophecy. The riddle is the most obvious. In introducing this strong baptismal imagery here, Jesus confuses this wayward Pharisee with an invitation to new life that he's just not ready to understand yet. The parable Jesus introduces invokes this ancient imagery from the time of Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness, to remind Nicodemus and to all of us listening beyond that it is for love that God does this, and it is in love that God's children will be believing. And the prophecy that Jesus gives is that Nicodemus, who will appear twice more in this gospel, will only come to the light. In other words, he will only share his faith publicly and fully experience his own rebirth once that perfect love that God offers takes full root within him, which is only going to happen after Jesus dies. You see, my friends, however we come to know Jesus more deeply, whether it is in the shadows of the night or by the light of day, God has always been moving with love in our lives all along. The spirit blows where it will, and the efficacy of the waters we gain our rebirth from are known only to God alone. They depend not on us or even our answer, but upon the response that my mentors gave me over two decades ago. We were saved 2,000 years ago. The rebirth Jesus desires for all of us takes root within us when we finally give space for it to go deep enough to let those fears that live within us release so that we can step into the light finally and let our faith be seen by all the world, by the things that we say and do, the ways that we live as Jesus did. That is how our rebirth truly sees the light of day. And we become even braver than Nicodemus was, as Jesus wants us to be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.